Johnny, Johnny, can you make a living out of the arts? Music, for instance. The arts, Johnny. Making money out of the arts. Music in particular. Well, it's very bloody difficult, you know, these days, to get any traction in making some bloody money out of that sort of stuff. Uh, but people like to think they can, and I suppose that's why they keep doing it. But that reminds me of another person, Johnny, who seems to be making a bloody fortune, even though he's a millionaire, seems to just keep making a bloody fortune. Yeah, yeah. Bruce Springsteen. Bruce? Why, what's Bruce doing? Yeah, Bruce Springsteen. I mean, Bruce has written songs for years and years about the downtrodden people. People who are poor and broken. The downtrodden. Yeah, people who are born to run. Okay, yes. And a couple of years back, Johnny, he admitted he said he's never done a fucking day's work in his life. Let alone being a downtrodden sack worker or a bloody Vietnam veteran. Jesus Christ! Now that's okay, I sort of forgave Bruce for that because that's his bloody art, his producing sort of stuff that, that is art. It doesn't necessarily have to be about him. Yeah, well, well, now you mention it. And Bruce became very, very wealthy, especially after the 80s. By Jesus, he made some money in the, in the 80s, Johnny. Well, I suppose. And he just sold his catalogue about 12 months ago to Sony or whatever for half a billion dollars. Oh, he made a bloody fortune, half a billion dollars. So, Bruce Springsteen, born to run, born to sell. Let's bring in Ali Canal with the mega deal that has dollar signs ringing in Bruce Springsteen's eyes. Ali? Amen, Adam. The boss is cashing in. According to multiple outlets, Bruce Springsteen sold both his master recordings and the music publishing side of his collection, aka his songwritings, for a deal that's worth north of $500 million. That's right, a half a billion dollars for Bruce Springsteen. That's according to multiple outlets out. But when he goes on tour these days, Johnny, his prices for tickets are so bloody expensive that people, they're outraged. Yeah! Outraged. I'll be honest with you, I was hoping when he came to Hyde Park that I was going to take my daughter. I was going to get decent tickets for us so she can have a very powerful and meaningful live experience with this music. But considering those tickets I wanted to buy, I think were about £400 plus. I decided not to bother. You really think about it, the price of the tickets, um, eating and drinking, just getting there and probably a hotel overnight. It's the cost of a family holiday. My word, how rock and roll is that? Now that got me thinking, I thought, well, he, he's a bloody billionaire already. Uh, if he likes going out on tour, that's fine, but he, uh, they could do the concert for half the price of the tickets and still do all right. I mean, how many billions does he need? Does he just keep going on and on and on? Johnny, are you saying these uh, these big artists should just go out and do do their touring for nothing? On and on and on, just making billions? Is it some sort of competition between these big artists to see who can get the biggest bloody tour figures? When it comes to live performers, Bruce Springsteen is a living legend. More than five decades after he and his E Street band started playing shows, Springsteen's fans have never felt cheated. Until now. Some tickets for Springsteen's 2023 U.S. tour cost between four and five thousand dollars apiece, setting off an online storm of outrage and forcing diehard fans to reevaluate their dedication. These ticket prices are obscene and insane for any artist. <laughs> Springsteen can't on that. But isn't it management's duty, Johnny, to make as much money for themselves and their artists as they can? Yeah, how much money do they need? He can do the whole concert, pay for the whole concert himself. Tour around and pay all the people and do everything and still break even. Well, I suppose, but that's a bit much to bloody ask, isn't it? And I've got a theory, Johnny. I've got a feeling that these big events and concerts and big super groups and all that, they don't actually care about the bloody downtrodden people. The downtrodden poor people? You mean they're not worried about them? No, they don't care at all. We used to think they did. <laughs> the 
me where I feel sort of a bit ripped off over the years that I believed in his music and uh, I thought it was great and everything, but in the end, he's just a greedy billionaire. Oh, I find that hard to believe. But it seems a lot of people are dipping their hands into this bloody rock and roll pot, money pot, and trying to extract as much money as they can from, they don't care from who. After everything is paid for, the profit is split up between the artist and the promoter, with the artist typically taking 85% and the promoter getting 15%. A fan for 50 years, <laughs> he's still gonna have to pay 400 bucks, sorry. So how does the promoter make money? That's where the fees come in, like service fees and order processing fees. Sometimes even artist managers bring in money through added on fees or the venue is making extra through facility charges. The big theme in terms of why are tickets more expensive now than they used to be is that promoters have more tools at their disposal to maximize revenue. So whether it's verified fan, platinum pricing, and now they have a really you know, much more precise way to understand what demand looks like and adjust prices on the fly. And on top of that, Johnny, I don't think these concerts are all that they, they're cracked up to be. <laughs> I mean, you and I, we went to Paul McCartney back in 1995, great show, but we were so fucking far away, we couldn't even make out his features with our binoculars. We're a fucking kilometre away. Yeah, oh, yeah, disappointing. Get it, you know, uh, especially if you wanted to sing like you did, say, 30 or 40 years ago. The point is, the tickets are $464 each to hear Paul McCartney in this condition. Now... It's not a really great show for an 82 or 3 year old to get out there and croak his way through a couple of hits and make half a billion dollars on the fucking ticket sales. <laughs> the same thing for you too, Johnny. When we went to U2 bloody 15 years ago, we were at this big arena and we were so fucking far away, all you could see were these tiny little figures on stage. Oh Jesus, that was disappointing. And quite frankly, I hate to admit it, I nearly dozed off at a U2 concert. Yeah, fell asleep. And people will just blindly pay it and say, oh, it's a bloody great concert, when actual fact it was shit. Hey Johnny, can you imagine if Paul and Bruce came out, they were together or, or singly, and came out and said, this year we're going to do the non-profit tour. Yeah, that's right. We're just going to tour to break even. We're going to get prices as cheap as we can. And I don't really give a shit whether we make a bloody half a billion dollars or what. Because we've all got plenty of money and... Uh... How many tickets to win? According to a new Polestar report, the Rolling Stones and U2 are the two only touring artists to exceed two billion in ticket grosses. Two newly created charts have measured ticket grosses and ticket sales with the Stones top in the gross sales chart and ranked third for ticket sales, earning 2.16 billion from 22 million tickets sold. While U2 took number one for total tickets and number two for gross sales, earning 2.12 billion from over 26 million tickets. The Stones might clear more ranks soon as Keith Richards strives the band to make new records, which will mean more touring. And Mick too. Mick could come out, Mick and Keith could come out and say, yeah, we're doing the bloody non-profit tour this year. That's got a good ring to it, Johnny. It would enhance their bloody their popularity, I reckon, without even bloody making a dent in their bloody in their fortunes. And this bloody ticketing system, Johnny, is they're turning into the bloody airlines. You know what I mean with the airlines? When you book a ticket two months out, it's fucking sixty bucks, but when it's a week before you want to go, it's three hundred and twenty. Ticketmaster calls this scheme dynamic pricing, a system already used by airlines and ride-sharing services. Dynamic pricing uses computer algorithms to constantly change prices according to market demand. It's aimed at cutting out resellers, so more money goes to the artist and the promoter. It's almost as if Ticketmaster and Live Nation are the scalpers at this point. They, try to, they, they say they wanted to eliminate it, but they became the scalpers. This music writer says he understands the intent behind dynamic pricing, but he thinks it's risky. The problem with dynamic pricing in a situation where the demand is extraordinarily high is that you are going to lock out a lot of fans. Some fans and politicians are calling for legislation 
to limit what they see as price gouging. Yeah, they're just doing what the scalpers out the front used to do. Oh, the airlines. <laughs> What about when they make you sit by the door in the middle of the plane and ask you to help them if there's a fucking crash? I mean, what sort of gall is that? But I'm saying this to you, Bono, if you're watching. Next time you become the moralistic bloody preacher that you were for fucking 20 years, next time you start waffling on about world hunger and peace, peace and all that sort of stuff, and just remember that you two are around and make fucking millions every three months. So Johnny, why do people just pay this bloody stuff? Why don't people say, nah, fuck you, yeah, I'm not paying that. Or am I just bloody dreaming, Johnny? Am I just dreaming for something unachievable?